Hello and welcome to PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. I'm your host, Ian Hartz, and tonight, coming to you from Monday night, breaking down the Seahawks' 23-17 victory over the Eagles. Also want to touch on some of the top waiver wire options ahead of Week 13. Thank you for tuning in. We bring you new episodes every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Without further ado, let's get after this enjoyable, very weird, at, po- at some points, drunk Monday night matchup. So, like I said, Seahawks won 23-17. It was a game that looked like Seattle might just run away with it from the beginning. I mean, their first two drives. They went for it on fourth down. They got denied. I think it was the same guy, actually, both times. Uh, Burnett uh, made a pair of just great plays for the Eagles to hold the Seahawks to zero points despite them moving the ball on those drives. They end up getting 14 points and building that two-touchdown lead, but Eagles were able to score just before halftime on a nice throw from Wentz to Goddard. Didn't, wasn't able to say a nice throw by Wentz a lot of times tonight, but that was uh, one of them. Third quarter, just saw a couple field goals. And the fourth, uh, same thing for the Seahawks. We did see the Eagles, though, get the backdoor Hail Mary cover of the century maybe not that much but we did see once throw a Hail Mary he got deflected Richard Rodgers grabbed it with one hand then they went for two because why not and uh, Miles Sanders was able to skirt in for the cover I know a lot of lines did close at six and a half after things opened up usually around three three and a half for Seahawks so I want to talk about Seattle first I mean look another just underwhelming fantasy game from Russell Wilson but it was still you know a great Real life performance is honestly what he is in bit the business for anyway, so don't blame him at all. But it's been a couple weeks in a row now where we've really, really not seen Russ cooking to the same extent. This game was a little bit different. I mean, again, even though they were only up one score, eight points for most of this uh, game, you know, until deeper into the fourth quarter when it became an 11 point game. I mean, Russell Wilson, he, they were still asking him to throw a lot. And I mean, the amount of air yards that DK Metcalf had in this one, uh, absolutely astronomical. 13 targets for him, 10 catches, 177 yards, seemingly all in Darius Slay's direct shadow coverage. I mean, come on, Philly, give your cornerback a little bit of safety help. I understand maybe once or twice you get caught, but at some point, you know, what are you doing over there? You know, you're not going to free or what's, as Einstein says, you know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again expecting different results and that was what it seemed like at a certain point and that's really just who Russ kept going back to again and again and again so could have been a much bigger performance if Metcalf had come down with a 25 yard touchdown but unfortunately uh, hit him in the chest after Slay had fallen down in the end zone so again just it's tough to critique any of like the decisions Russ made or the passes. We just didn't get that multi-touchdown, 300, 400 yard chunk game that we had been spoiled with for the better part of the uh, you know early weeks of the season. So Russ, maybe someone we don't need to be completely locking into the top three of our quarterback rankings week after week. But come on, you're not you know ever going to be benching this guy under any uh, circumstances unless you're just beyond blessed at the position. So uh, you know, pretty touchdown to David Moore for his only uh, score after picking up about 50 to Metcalf on a bomb. Still saw him you know taking off and running a little bit six carries 12 yards just didn't have as much success with it so again you know very good game from Russ and real life stance just didn't give us the sort of fantasy production we were hoping for Tyler Lockett snoozing in this one only four targets three catches 23 yards drew a defensive pass interference late but pretty questionable call if I do say so myself otherwise I mean uh, David Moore three catches for negative six yards and one score that's a pretty uh, Jordan Howard-esque line there I enjoy it that's some good stuff Uh, and then you know nobody else even approached uh, three catches or even 20 five receiving yards so very isolated game didn't see any of these tight ends do much and look this passing game particularly when we're condensing things down now not giving Russ the same uh you know total number of just raw attempts it's going to be Metcalf and Lockett more weeks than not and as we're seeing you know these matchups where defenses really want to try to guard Metcalf with one guy as long as that one guy is not Patrick Peterson or Jalen Ramsey Russ seemingly has no problem continuously taking advantage of that matchup with this backfield Chris Carson, fantasy football managers. You guys might want to sit down here before I keep going because not great. Carson ended up playing 23 snaps. Carlos freaking Hyde played 38, everybody. And we also saw, uh, okay, it was just those two in the backfield, which is good. And, you know, no, no Travis Homer, no DJ Dallas, none of those guys, which is a good thing. But again, 38 to uh, 23 snap disparity between Hyde and Carson didn't even make sense. I mean, I guess they were using Hyde in the fourth quarter to really grind things out, but he only had 15 carries for 22 yards. So I'm sure if we looked at just the first three quarters, which you can te- check out my running back article, it's out every Wednesday on pff.com. I go into more uh, in depth stuff you know on situations like this but I imagine if we look at the first three quarters it's going to paint a more clear you know 60 40 uh, split for Carson but clearly this is not the same you know 75 80 percent workhorse that we grew used to seeing last year and there were stretches last year when Rashad Penny was healthy this was more of a 50 50 situation so it might end up being that here moving forward between Chris Carson and Carlos Hyde they like Hyde Hyde's game could have been a little bit better if we had this 15 yard touchdown uh, not nullified by a penalty but I mean that penalty pretty much made the touchdown happen so we can't give him too much uh, credit for that one. 
And yeah, I mean, look, Carson looked like a beast on a 16-yard touchdown run, breaking arm tackles, and he dragged poor uh, Robbie McLeod in from like the four-yard line and was also out there, you know, catching two passes for 18 yards. But Hyde had three targets. Carson had two. Like, it wasn't even a situation where Carson was necessarily the lead pass down back and Hyde was just this early down grinder. It seemed like they just wanted to give Hyde the ball at the end, and they were rotating the guys, you know, pretty much like every couple plays from the first drive on. So very concerning. It was Carson's first game back, and we'll see what Carroll says afterwards. But I think they like Hyde, and they brought him in for a reason. And apparently, Apparently, you know, hoping to maybe not get Carson again, they are going to continue to utilize a bit of a two RB backfield. So we're still talking about this Seattle offense. There's going to be a lot of scoring opportunities to go around, particularly for Carson, who remains the primary back. We think we're pretty freaking positive, uh, but just realize, you know, high being there. Anytime anybody's getting 15 carries, you now regardless of the circumstances, we got to be at least a little bit worried about moving forward, and that is the case with Chris Carson. He's still going to be, you know, a top 15 back next week. We'll give him the benefit of the doubt, but particularly if Penny ends up being able to get off that. Uh, pup list and get back uh, from that knee injury we could suddenly be talking about a rather crowded seattle backfield Moving on to the Eagles, I think. Let me make sure I didn't miss anything on my notes here. Oh, one last thing. DK Metcalf had a super swaggy play where he caught a deep ball, went out of bounds, popped up and flipped the camera or flipped the ball straight into the camera. Really good moment. And then he dropped a touchdown like immediately after. So that is my last note uh, for the Seattle Seahawks with the Eagles. Uh, yeah, so Carson Wentz, this was one of his worst games of the season. I don't know what he needed to do to get benched because, you know, Jalen Hurts ended up only playing, I believe, it was two or three total snaps in this one. He played two snaps in the first half, and we did not really see him for the duration of the second half here. I'm looking it up right now. Yeah, two total snaps for Jalen Hurts in this game. He completed a six-yard pass, and he handed the ball off once. Like, there was nothing Jalen Hurts did wrong, although someone, there was a Philadelphia Eagles beat writer that said that apparently uh, Hurts uh, tried to run on the field at one point, but he ran out there with the wrong helmet, and the Eagles had to call a timeout because of it. So maybe they had that one little, you know, miscommunication thing, and they said, screw it, we're going with Carson the rest of the way that's the only thing I can think of because you know going 215 yards two touchdowns and a pick and that stat line is inflated as hell because of that Hail Mary to Richard Rodgers and look I've said on this podcast many a time I don't like taking away players big plays unless they're super fluky I mean in this case we might, might as well take away that 32 yard score from Wentz he deserved to finish with only one touchdown and underneath 200 yards hey he got it going but I mean it was just one bad play after another from him he took six sacks and I you know the announcers were really talking him up all game I I don't know. It was uh, not really the game I think you, they should have picked to really talk him up. I know there's a bunch of injuries in the offensive line. Wasn't a ton of separation out there, but how many times are you going to overthrow these receivers, Carson? It's like he wasn't even giving these dudes a chance. Alshon Jeffrey is getting overthrown. On what planet are you trying to lead Jeffrey down the field and hoping that he'll catch up to it? There's another play where, again, look, we don't know the, uh, and I know this is the reason why a lot of people critique PFF in the first place. Like, obviously, none of us know the responsibilities that go around every single play. We just got to do our best uh, with what we can and what we can see and what we learn to try to do so. And there is a point where, you know, Wentz had time. You see Alshon Jeffrey just completely blow past everybody because, again, what cornerback w- would expect Alshon to run past them? I, I understand why he got so over open but once they even looked there just kind of got happy feet and dumped it down to Miles Sanders so just you know erratic all game he was making questionable decisions the announcers were talking about like why was he even thrown to this guy versus man coverage you know again I'm not gonna pretend like I know every single thing that's going through Wentz's mind for these plays but it was more than a few occasions where it wasn't just uh, you know a physically uh, bad throw that happened plenty too but also just one mental mistake seemingly uh, after another so yeah I don't know what Wentz needed to do to get pulled from this one you know they, they would have a ton of dead money if they wanted to go to Jalen Hurts. But, you know, as we talk about with everyone's favorite uh, NFL Network reporter, sometimes got to take these uh, workload assessments with a grain of salt. You know, certainly wasn't a situation where they uh, came in with a true plan for Hurts because two snaps and he completed a pass in this. Like, we need to get more on this story about what the heck went into this game thinking that Hurts would have a big role. Because, again, there just wasn't any sort of plan out there. They didn't even try to execute it, and Wentz wasn't playing nearly good enough to warrant staying out there. So, yeah, just brutal. I mean, credit to him for getting Dallas Goddard 75 yards and a touchdown, I guess. But even then, you know, just just not too many good throws on the one. Goddard should have had a massive day. He had two times where he had a linebacker matched up on him. And I, I said Wentz had been overthrowing a lot of guys. Everyone except Dallas Goddard, because on both of these passes, if Wentz had just put the ball, you know, even moderately in an accurate spot. I mean, Goddard had run past both these linebackers. We're talking about him going for 150-plus 
plus yards. Unfortunately, it didn't. One of them, they were able to draw defensive pass interference, so it wasn't a total waste, but just one missed opportunity after another. And I just feel like that, you know, Wentz, uh, you saw him take off a little bit, end up getting 42 rushing yards, and that kind of has been the fallback this year. When things really aren't going well for Wentz, he starts using his legs. It's dangerous. He hasn't gotten hurt yet. We will see what happens. Again, just really can't dress his game up well at all. Wentz had some solid stretches this year. He started off terribly in the first three weeks. He got that 49ers comeback. And the next couple weeks after that, particularly with Travis Fulgham, he was making a lot of plays out there and doing a lot of good things despite not having a lot of talent around him. Well, his talent's come back in recent weeks. And again, it's not like he's missing just wide open receivers again and again. But at some point, you know, we can't keep cutting this guy slack. He's been turning the ball over really for the better part of the past two years at one of the highest rates in the league. He's taking sacks. He's not making explosive plays. He's not making anything resembling accurate throws. Need to see much more from Carson Wentz moving forward. I know with that contract, that's certainly in the franchise's long-term interest to, uh, you know, keep him on the roster because if not, they're going to be eating a ton of dead salary. But you drafted Hurst in the second round. What's the plan? Let's hear it. Let's see it. Because right now, whatever the plan is, clearly is not working for the 3-7-1 Philadelphia Eagles. Mentioned some of these receivers, but yeah, Goddard led the way, 75 yards and a touchdown. Richard Rodgers ended up having 52 yards and a score thanks to that aforementioned uh, Hail Mary. Boston Scott had five catches, 40 yards. Nobody else over 20. Alshon seemed to be really souping away some target opportunities from Travis Fulgham. Ultimately, Jeffrey had four. Fulgham had two. Jalen Rager had seven targets. Wasn't really separating on any of them. Only kind of play where he looked good at all was just a uh, you know screen he was able to get up the field on. Miles Sanders had a drop thrown in there and just wasn't able to get much going on the ground. Six carries, 15 yards for him so another disappointing game for Miles Sanders he was dominating the snaps though for the most part I mean 38 snaps for Sanders 24 for Boston Scott you know I was getting some tweets throughout the game people wondering where Miles Sanders was going look negative game script they did not want to commit to the run at all and just again Eagles hardly had a plan in the quarterback room didn't that seem to kind of peel over to the rest of the offense as well so Obviously disappointed to see Sanders finish with only three targets and Boston Scott get six. Sanders has been someone coming back from the injury that we've been firing up as, you know, a legit top eight running back with this Eagles offense in the current state it is. We're going to have to back off of that stand, slide him more down into an upside RB2 role. It's still going to be very hard to rank, you know, more than 12 or 13 running backs ahead of Miles Sanders. But we're seeing too much Boston Scott involved in these negative game script games, and we're just not seeing enough of a devotion to, you know, hashtag establish that run with Sanders. So tough situation for him, you know, similar to the clock. Edwards Alaire a little bit, you know, an offense that we just expected so much more from the beginning of the year, you know, based on their uh, talents as both a rusher and receiver, just haven't quite seen them put it all together really the entire season. Uh, quickly with some of these snaps, Rager played 38, Fulgham played 33, Greg Ward played 43, and Alshon played 32. Yeah, this is a problem. So they're keeping, you know, AAF all-star Greg Ward as the number one receiver out there at all time because he fits a typical archetype of a slot receiver. So, you know, good luck there. Just keep doing the way keep doing things the way you've always done them I guess that always works out in life right but John Hightower is out there for 18 snaps as well it, it's just it's going to be very hard to trust anybody other than Dallas Goddard in this passing game in fantasy land because now we have a legit almost five wide receiver rotation of these guys moving in and out in previous weeks, it was Travis Fulgham was uh, playing well over Alshon Jeffrey, and we had Ward in the slot and Rager on the outside. But now, Rager's losing snaps to John Hightower. Fulgham's losing sa- snaps to Jeffrey. Ward's the only consistent wide receiver there, and he had one catch for three yards in this one. So if you can, if you can stay, stay the hell away from this Eagles offense the rest of the season throughout your fantasy playoffs, of which I hope you all have comfortably made at this point in the season. That is going to do it for this game preview, everybody. I want to give a quick shout-out to our sponsors at Monkey knife fight people come and ask me and they say ian i want to sign for pff how can i get it for less money and the answer is go to monkey knife fight deposit twenty dollars use code pff and boom you will have a free forty dollar pff edge annual subscription and with that subscription you didn't technically even pay twenty dollars yet because you can use that twenty dollars on daily fantasy games on different prop games at monkey knife fight awesome website awesome product and again twenty dollars code pff and you get that forty dollar pff edge subscription sounds like a great situation to me go Go check it out. Code PFF. I want to go through some waiver wire stuff now, everybody. I encourage you to check out pff.com for you know some more just insightful articles on the uh, just waiver wire in general. We have a bunch of good writers uh, you know take their hand at it, but I like to just go through use about eight to ten players on this episode of the podcast that I've noticed being floated around the industry. Not everyone I list is someone that you know I'm recommending by any stretch of the imagination, but just trying to get you know my opinion out on these big guys. Hopefully, let you all know who you should be you know spending your last remaining fab on, who you should be blowing that waiver wire priority for, who you should maybe 
you know, be uh, really going after and he should maybe be letting somebody else, uh, you know, take on that landmine. So without further ado, Devontae Booker, because NFL Network's Ian Rapport says Josh Jacobs has a chance to play with his sprained ankle, but a situation where, you know, certainly wouldn't be surprising if he does miss at least a week or two. Jalen Richard has had a chest injury and then a non-COVID illness kept him out last week. So it would make sense if those are related. Just not sure. Either way, he's been missing these games. Even if Richard comes back, like we were expecting Devontae Booker to be the handcuff to have in week 13 and potentially beyond, depending on this Jacobs ankle situation, because we look at what happened last year with Jacobs banged up. Jalen Richard was the whole time, but we saw Deontay Washington, who's now in the Dolphins, get three starts for the Raiders. In those three starts, he has 63% snaps, 63% snaps, and 74% snaps, 20, 25, and 25 touches per game, including 19 combined targets. I mean, the Raiders would not throw the ball to Josh Jacobs last year. For some reason, fed Deontay Washington as soon as Jacobs got hurt. So we did not see them go to a three-back committee. They just kind of have Washington take his usual role and end add Jacobs, you know, usual touches on top of that. So, hey, if Rashard is out and Jacobs is out, we could be talking 80, 90% just workhorse three down RB Devontae Booker season. If Richard's back, Rashard's back, excuse me. Okay, we're going to be more of a 60, 70% rate. Either way, 20 plus touches. Booker will probably be a top 12, top 15 option at the position this week. Haven't done my rankings just yet. Got the Steelers out uh, Ravens game throwing everybody off a little bit. But uh, with that in mind, yeah, I think Booker is the number one running back to target in this one. I don't think there's any one that we can feel too good about, you know, going after this week that could just offer returns just all the way down the end of the season. And hey, we need to win this week 13 matchup right now. So go get Devontae Booker because I think, uh, you know, this could be the spot for him against a Jets defense that, come on, we know, we know it's the freaking Jets. Even if they do sell to stop the run sometimes, fully expecting a nice bounce back game from Derek Carr and company on the scoreboard. Don't be afraid to get their lead running back. Seriously, everyone, do not put too much stock into that admittedly awful game that we saw the Raiders doing against the Falcons. They had scored over over 30 points three straight weeks before that and again this is a prime bounce back spot so go get Devontae Booker if you can and fire him up as a legit upside RB2 in this dream matchup Kirk Cousins and Ryan Fitzpatrick are my top two streaming quarterbacks of the week. Cousins is my QB 12 facing a Jaguars defense that, oh my gosh, I mean, 32 and 32nd in yards per attempt, 28th in explosive pass play rate allowed, and then 30th in pressure rate, QB rating allowed, and fantasy points per game. Look, Cousins, the only issue is volume. He has had six games here, fewer than 30 pass attempts, but at this point, he's almost in the Ryan Tannehill sphere of you know, efficiency where he can just make the most out of 25, 30 pass attempts because he's got his own ballers at receiver with Justin Jefferson, hopefully Adam Thielen back and even without Adam Thielen last week we saw Chad Beebe, BC Johnson, Kyle Rudolph, a bunch of guys you know stepping up gotta give Kirk Cousins some credit, he has set in career best marks this season in PFF passing grade, yards per attempt and average target depth alike so it makes sense that Dalvin Cook's able to instill his will on the ground but Cousins he's earned weekly borderline QB1 treatment and plus matchups which is exactly what this is Excuse me, Ryan Fitzpatrick, again, my QB 14 on the week. He's averaged a perfectly solid 17.7 fantasy points per game. This is a different offense with him under center. I mean, because he gives you that dual threat kind of just uh, thing defense has got to look out for. I understand that he'd probably lose a race to Tua. Tua's far from a statue himself. But Tua, seven carries, 35 yards on the ground in week nine. Otherwise, has negative one rushing yards the rest of the season. So he just hasn't consistently run the ball, even if he does some good things, you know, in terms of just off script, making plays behind the line of scrimmage. Patrick's at 18.9 rushing yards per game. I mean, that is a legit, nice, uh, you know, fancy rushing floor that we look for at the quarterback position. And then also, they just let, you know, Fitz actually throw the ball. 33.7 pass attempts per start, two at just 25. And if we want to be nice and remove the week 11, you know, injury slash performance bench dud that he had against the Broncos. So the Bengals, I mean, just like Kirk Cousins has this great matchup against the Jaguars, Fitzpatrick has the Bengals' league worst defense and pressure rate. I mean, Fitz has been the perfect QB for Devontae Parker and Mike Jusick. He's contested catch ways. I don't think that, you know, last week, Bengals, a close game against the Giants was really indicative of what we should expect from them moving forward. I truly think the Bengals, not even the Jets, I think the Bengals are the worst team in the NFL right at this second uh, based on what we saw in that game. They kept it close, but the fact they couldn't win with a kick return touchdown and then getting the ball at the 50 yard line down two, which I don't even know how they got the ball back, but it was just, it was insane how Brandon Allen could not move that ball the entire game until the Giants noticeably wanted to prevent defense at the end. Bengals defense has never been you know anything to fear throughout the year but now you add again I think the single worst offense in the league to something they got to deal with and yeah I expect the Miami Dolphins to roll in this one Fitzpatrick to be a big reason why. So Royce Freeman I've seen float around a little bit. I, don't, I think he's someone we should not be targeting at all. He needs another Melvin Gordon injury to be anything resembling you know a fantasy relevant option this week. Philip Lindsay 
does have the knee injury. You know, we'll see if that keeps him out uh, for week 13 and beyond or not. But, you know, Gordon this year in three games without Lindsey, 21, 12, and 25 touches on 79%, 62%, 80% snap rates. And look, that 12 touches on 62% snaps, that came in an 18-point you know, point blowout loss to the Buccaneers. So this is a situation where even if a blowout is likely against the Chiefs, like, okay, Broncos are two touchdown underdogs. Why do we want the number two running back on a team that who knows is going to be under center at this point? So Gordon's the you know viable fantasy option. Even then, he's going to be you know a lower-end RB2 because of this spot that's probably going to feature. Not too many points from the Broncos and them having to you know throw the ball more than they would prefer otherwise. And again, Freeman, he's the clear RB2 in a bad offense. Like, just stay away, everybody. Cam Akers. So the Rams have one offensive touchdown in week 12. And on that drive, Cam Akers had three carries. And it was a three-play drive. Akers went 61 yards, six yards, and then one touch, one yard to uh, get the score. On the next drive, he was in there. But then Malcolm Brown came back and when they went full two-minute mode. Look, in the first half, Akers played just 8% or 6% of the offensive snaps. Like, maybe they make a drastic switch based on that one drive. But I don't know. I wouldn't say it's particularly imminent. Now, the good thing with Akers and even Henderson as just guys to keep on your bench is that they're both just one injury away to anyone in this backfield from being a viable back. I mean, we've seen now Malcolm Brown, they like him. He's steady, secure. Uh, he can be their pass down back, which he has been. He can be their short yardage back, which he is. He's not, you know, no, a full-time goal line vulture. Again, Akers had a one-yard touchdown last week, but he can do everything they want him to do. But we've seen them, you know, really cut back his carries as the year has gone on. So if Brown or Henderson goes down, Akers would be a legit top 24 option. And the same is true for Henderson if Brown or Akers goes down. So both Akers and Henderson, as long as everyone's healthy, it's going to be tough to treat them as more than, you know, a low ceiling flex. But if one guy gets down, then all of a sudden we're talking. So usually we would need, you know, a one RB backfield. But in this case, I think Brown, even though the snaps are still there for him, I think he's not involved enough in terms of just pure usage uh, from a touch standpoint to really be all that much of a burden to either guy. DeAndre Washington for the Dolphins. I talked about him a little bit earlier and what he did for the Raiders last year, but he led the way in snaps last week of 48%, Matt Breida 32%, uh, and Patrick Laird at 14%. But what was particularly impressive was that Breida had 11 to 12 snaps in the first quarter, wasn't all that effective. And from then on, Washington led the way in every quarter, including 15 of 19 snaps in the fourth. So the problem is, this is not a three down roll. Miles Gaskin seemed really close to coming back last week, and we don't know what's going on with Salvin Ahmed in the shoulder. So, you know, hey, we're playing uh, it's, it's a situation where they're playing uh i think washington first and foremost and i get it but you know even in a good matchup here uh that they got going for them against the Bengals, i just don't know that we can be all that confident in washington getting uh you know between 15 and 20 touches he would be my bet to do it but you know give me Devonte booker for sure over washington and again cannot stress this enough we need gaskin and ahmed to be out to have any sort of confidence uh in washington here so hey let's assume both those guys get ruled out and we roll into sunday and you know we're looking at this Bengals matchup okay washington might be in that top 24 top 25 rb conversation just realize this is very very flimsy at the moment if one of those guys comes back i do expect them to be the lead back here Five more. Thanks for sticking with us, everybody. Uh, Michael Pittman, I continue to see him, you know, popping up. So talented rookie receiver. But as we talked about on this podcast, like we just haven't seen enough for him in non just easy situations. PFF has some cool behind the scenes tools where you can actually look at separation. You know, was the receiver wide open, open, or was the defender closing or in tight coverage and stuff? So, you know, I took away uh, wide open and just open passes. So I wanted to see just when things were at least covered a little bit. And you look at that this year, Pittman, again, and not non and non wide open or open coverage he has conscious seven of 16 targets for 64 yards and no scores like ty hilton zach pascal trey burton mo alley cox marcus johnson all have over 100 yards this year with the, in these limited separation situations so it's not you know a colts thing where they just no one's produced without having this separation it's really been michael pittman and even last week i mean he had two catches and one of them was just that token wide open unguarded crosser that we saw him have his two big plays on the week before that got the whole you know fan communities uh, pants pennies all up in the bunch in the first place so situation where hey i would guess he'll be the number one guy in this offense in terms of total production you know based on this week to the end of the year and they do have some good matchups against the texans raiders and texans uh going into week 16 or excuse me the steelers in week 16 but texans raiders texans in three weeks you know we can work with that particularly with uh, bradley roby now suspended uh, fr uh from that texans uh defense so hey it's i get it he's someone that i don't think is ever going to be you know consistent wide receiver too but we have seen him have some solid games Philip Rivers you know even if his arm strength isn't as what isn't as 
good as he used to be. You know, he's still a smart guy, and he has created those openings for Pittman. So if he's going to get those going again, I could see it being in these matchups. But he is a flex, everybody. Like, I was getting freaking questions with Michael Pittman alongside some, you know, top 20 wide receivers, some start sick questions last Sunday. Get that out of here. He's going to maybe crack the top 40. He's a, you know, upside. He's kind of an upside wide receiver three if we want to be nice. But just realize, since week seven by, Pittman has 27 targets. Naeem Hines has 27. Zach Pascal is 25. Trey Burton, 19. T.Y. Hilton, 18. Mohali Cox, 14. Marcus Johnson, 14. Rivers has been spreading the ball around all season long. And Pittman just hasn't quite shown that just alpha I'm taking over. Excuse me. He hasn't shown that alpha. I'm taking over just thing that we've seen from you know Justin Jefferson last year with AJ Brown, uh, even T Higgins earlier this year. Like there's moments in these you know seasons where we see a young a young rookie wide receiver really uh, come on and just start making all sorts of plays. Hasn't been the case with Pittman. I think we just got a little bit too sucked in to one or two highlights on some you know primetime matchups that he might have had. Uh, Corey Davis is someone that we've talked about in this segment before, and just want to keep pointing out guys that him and AJ, AJ Brown both are having them some pretty great seasons. So A.J. Brown, 61 targets on the year. Corey Davis, 56. A.J. Brown, 40 catches. Corey Davis, 42. A.J. Brown, 638 yards. Corey Davis, 619. Now, come on, guys. It's A.J. B. He has eight touchdowns, including uh, one more an onside kick and Corey Davis only has three so AJ Brown's the wide receiver five in fantasy points per game no one here is trying to say it's Corey Davis season no I will never you know say that unironically but Corey Davis wide receiver 29 fantasy points per game so uh, you know he had that week nine goose egg that sucked but otherwise has five catches 50 receiving yards or score in every other game uh, and just like Michael Pittman has a nice end of season schedule uh, Corey Davis and the Titans have the Browns Jaguars and then the Lions before facing the Packers in week 16 give me Corey Davis Davis over Michael Pittman any day of the week and twice on Sundays. Also like these Buffalo Bills wide receivers more than Pittman as well, to be honest with you, especially Cole Beasley. You know, only had four targets last week, saved by the passing score that he actually hooked up with Gabriel Davis on. Look, it was only because Josh Allen had 24 attempts. So, you know, the schedule that looked really monstrous in the offseason at this point, they got 49ers, Steelers, Broncos, and Patriots coming out. Look, other than the Steelers, I mean, the 49ers and Broncos are so banged up that we've seen, you know, truly good offenses be able to take advantage of them. And the Patriots Patriots starting to look a little bit better uh, lately, but still a bottom five defense and explosive pass play rate allowed. So Beasley, someone that I, I think is going to be cracking that top 30 at the position here in week 13 and beyond. And Gabriel Davis is in that upside, you know, wide receiver three, boomer bust wide receiver four range himself. Quickly, I want to talk about this Josh Allen needs Smokey Brown narrative because I 100% disagree with it. There are still plenty of weapons in Buffalo. We have Stefan Diggs. We have a getting healthy Dawson Knox, Beasley, Gabriel Davis, who has looked great. And we've also seen like the point, the games we're looking at is weeks five, seven, and 12. That's the sample size these, you know, haters out there are putting out. But you look at weeks one, one, six, eight, and ten with Smokey Brown involved. And Josh Allen was putting up, you know, very similar yards per attempt. He even had two worse games than he ever had without Smokey Brown with him in action. So, like, at what point do we draw a line here? Because I do believe in on-off splits, but like Smokey Brown, he played 29 snaps and had two catchless targets in week three. Josh Allen threw for 311 yards and four scores against the Rams. So, no, I'm out on this idea that Josh Allen, this passing game, lives and dies with John Brown. I love John Brown. He's a great NFL wide receiver, and okay, I'm willing to consider and concede that the Bills, you know, are better with John Brown than without. But Gabriel Davis, and we've seen him provide enough that, you know, John Brown, who usually is their number three wide receiver on a weekly basis. He's not, you know, necessarily the key that just unlocks his offense from being average to great or anything. Again, I, they, they want John Brown. I understand that. But just don't be, you know, sitting Cole Beasley or Josh Allen down the stretch purely because John Brown is out. It's a piece of the puzzle, and I get that. But I don't think it's anything near, you know, a Matt Ryan's with or without Julio Jones type of situation. Uh, two more groups to go over, everybody. Brashad Perryman and Denzel Mims with the Jets. So Sam Darnold, single game high mark uh, for his career, 12 point eight yard average target death you know everybody loves it except Jameson Crowder obviously uh, Denzel Mims brief lower body injury but came back in the game so he's apparently fine and he tied with Perryman for a team high eight targets so this would be where I draw the line and I would start Michael Pittman over Brashad Perryman or uh, Denzel Mims because we shouldn't really assume that Crowder's out of the picture like what Pittman's dealing with I mean this is hardly you know a situation that we have a good feel of and unlike uh, you know what Pittman has Pittman has a great situation in Indy with Philip Rivers you know putting up points more weeks than not cannot say that 
the same thing about uh, Perryman and Mims with the Jets. Just realize, you know, that, you know, Darnold Dink and Dunk guy we saw earlier in the year, he seems to be willing to throw downfield with these guys out there. So Perryman and Mims, you're not going to feel good about it, but we can at least feel, you know, more uh, good about firing them as, you know, the desperate, boom, robust wide receiver fours. I think there's a slightly better chance uh, of them booming based on what we saw in that first Darnold uh, spot. Obviously, though, a deep ball from Darnold, not quite the same as one from uh, Patrick Mahomes or even Philip Rivers at this point. Last guy is Kiki Cootie. So I came on this podcast last week and told you guys, you know, don't do not be blowing uh, your waiver fab on Cootie because even though he had, you know, the 11 catch, uh, 110 yard performance in playoff game as a rookie, had 109 yards and another 11 catches in his first career game back in 2018. I mean, he is Randall Cobb in this offense. And before today, this offense included Will Fuller and Brandon Cooks as the clear cut number one, number two pass game options. That's now not the case. Kiki Cootie is going to be back to being the number two pass game option that he was during certain stretches of 2018 he put up big numbers Deshaun Watson is playing better than ever there is a chance that this goes down a little bit because we've seen him this throughout his career with Will Fuller in 33 games, Deshaun Watson has averaged 26.1 PPR points, 8.8 yards per attempt. Without Fuller, though, down to 22 fantasy points, 7.3 yards per attempt. So, you know, a difference of 4.1 fantasy points and one uh, 1. 1.5 yards per attempt, like, that's pretty brutal. But you look at Brandon Cooks, who's played with, you know, Tom Brady, Jared Goff, Drew Brees, and now Deshaun Watson. Every single quarterback that Brandon Cooks has played with throughout his career has averaged more yards per attempt with Cooks on the field than without. Speed kills, we get this it's unfortunate fuller is going to be out of the picture and by the way whatever ped was on you know let's let's spread that around will if it was keeping you healthy man uh, and save some for the rest of us uh you know and also by the way houston texans uh, assistant strength coach brian cushing starting to starting to add up everybody but uh you know in all seriousness kiki cutie number two option in this passing game okay just like uh you know some of these other situations like buffalo like okay the texans are for sure not going to be as good without will fuller out there but deshaun watson josh allen ballers are going to ball regardless of the circumstances i think they're still gonna be putting up more than enough points for their top two passing game options at a minimum to put up some seriously great numbers and also uh, last point jordan akins would be the preferred ad at tight end we saw the texans use a ton of two tight end formations last year i would expect that to be the case with akins and darren fells joining cootie and brandon cooks and most of their you know two tight end two wide receiver formations that's gonna do it everybody thank you for tuning as in as always to pff fantasy football podcast i'm ian hardis you can find me on twitter at iHeartist again, bringing you new episodes every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Hope you all had a great week 12, but we are on to week 13. Let's make it a good one and safely get in those fantasy playoffs that we have not clinched out already. So until next time, take care, everybody. Thanks for watching the PFF YouTube channel. And if you want to subscribe, all you have to do is push the button. Don't forget everything you get. A little fantasy, push the button. A little green line for the gambling aspects of the game, push the button. College football, push the button. The YouTube channel from PFF.